Hey guys, Taki here. I recently did a video on the RGB 10 Max 3 Pro, and in that video, I was kind of impressed that it could do some PlayStation 2 emulation, but I'm actually more surprised after the fact because I found that it can do a lot more, including some systems that I never thought would run on this, like 3DS. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at some of those extra systems, and we're gonna evaluate the retail software of this device because this is now shipping out to people. As a price recap, this guy is going for $115 at this point, but they do have SKUs that are a little higher than that with an SD card. My original unit didn't come with one, but they sent me a 128 gigabyte card that comes with the highest package, and we'll look at what that includes in just a moment. This is gonna be a look at what the device will come with out of the box. If we go into system settings and into information, we can see that we're using just enough Linux, and we're on a build that was built at the end of last month. We are running on kernel 6.1.42. So that's a recent Linux kernel, and that has some implications that I went over in my last video. Now I've gotta be honest with you, I'm kinda of surprised that they shipped this device with this software for a few big reasons. We're gonna go over all of them in this section. I thought they would go with a different operating system for this that didn't have these issues because I don't believe this software is ready for the mainstream. It can do a lot of impressive stuff and I'm still gonna show off the impressive stuff that it can do, but I'm not gonna lower my standards to say that this is acceptable for a retail release. And I don't believe anybody would feel that this is ready for average users. It even irks me a bit to use it the way that it is right now. So I just want that to be plainly mentioned here because I really don't like when people shill these devices and the software is made out to be like it's perfect, when in this instance, it is not. So that's the disclaimer. Now let's talk about those issues. So the first issue is one that I already addressed in my last video, and as you can see, this software has screen tearing that so far has not been fixed. On any hardware, this is an instant deal breaker for me. I don't really wanna use something like this because I have plenty of options to go with when I want to game. I don't need to go with something that has this. And it's kind of a shame because this system is competitive for the price. I picked a game to show this off like pretty clearly because we're going to do an entire video on this operating system and I'm planning to take a look at a lot of emulation. So there's no way you won't see it, but this is going to be me specifically pointing it out. So let's go into Alpha Sapphire and big surprise, this thing does run 3DS and it runs it pretty well. And I picked this because there's a lot of texture on this grass here, and you're gonna see that it's going to show a lot of tearing, but it might come across as wobbling in the grass and the buildings. I can slow this down just so you can see it a bit better, but you know, it's not smooth. And it's like this in every game that you can play. But I just think it's pretty obvious in this one. Some games are going to be more obvious than others, and some aren't this noticeable, but this is a glaring issue with this software, which is kind of why I was not expecting that Pow Kitty would ship this. This is fine if someone wants to be a beta user, but ideally, you'd have another operating system that doesn't have this issue as your base OS, and people could opt into this build if they wanted to experiment with higher end systems. And maybe you'd be willing to opt into that for $115, but this, is the default experience. And there's also no deadline for when this can be fixed because right now it looks unfixable. Maybe it won't be like that forever, but never buy a handheld shown to you on YouTube based on a promise or wishful thinking of what it might be in the future. That's just advertising. And again, it's like this in every game that you can play. So it's kind of like, is that acceptable? Maybe to some people, not really to me. Our next big issue is the fact that sleep mode doesn't work on this. So if you press this button, it will go to sleep, like you can see it's sleeping right now, but you will not be able to wake this back up again. And it's really kind of crap because almost every device that's on the market these days has sleep functionality. And this is another issue that this software has that they have not been able to fix. But it seems like this one is at least probably easier to fix than the other bug. If you end up putting the device to sleep, you're gonna have to do a hard reset by holding down the power button, and then you're gonna be able to reboot the system again, or at least it would seem like you are. There are some strange issues where you have to unplug the power cable before you can do a reboot. The next big issue is one that I already brought up in my other video. This thing doesn't have Wi-Fi, so your only option is to use a dongle. I already spoke about dongles in that video. Anytime that I see this, I'm just reminded that this should have been part of the device. Every time I see any hardware where you have to do this, I just know it's not for me. It just looks way too stupid. The last problem is with HDMI. This device does not have working HDMI at this point, and that's a big issue because this processor has a lot more potential than it can demonstrate with the low resolution screen that we have. There's a big mismatch here. There are a lot of systems that you could render up to 1080p or 720p, but there's no point to do that because your screen resolution is so low. So that's where HDMI would come into play. 
you'd be able to render those games higher to take advantage of the hardware that you bought and make this into a better deal. But right now, HDMI doesn't work and there's no timeline for when it will be fixed. So those are the current issues that this device has. And for the record, I like that this device runs just enough Linux. And I also like the people that work on it. Palkitty's solution provider really just dropped the ball on doing some basic porting for the Retro Arena build. And they were left with just enough Linux as their only option but I feel this will be annoying for them to be quote unquote responsible for fixing these issues since Palkitty co-opted their image for the retail release. It just feels like a mixed bag and I wouldn't want to have that pressure. But now that we've covered all of those bugs, we're gonna go into the performance section, which has a lot of stuff that I'm kind of surprised by. But before we do that, let's take a look at the SD card because I know a lot of people ask about these things. The only reason why I have this is because I asked for a retail version of this device with the software that they were going to use and they just sent me this SD card, which is kind of useless. So I'm just gonna use that with my old unit. Anyway, here's a look at the contents of the card. Okay, I don't wanna spend that long on this because obviously this drive is really big, but I did just wanna give you an overview of what this has. This is a directory view of the card that I have, and you can see that I'm using almost all of the space, but I did remove some files that this came with. I mainly removed PS1 games that this had because there was a ton of space dedicated to that and PSP. I don't believe that this had any 3DS, GameCube, or Wii games. So for those systems, I added games and those are the ones that you'll see in this video. Outside of that, if we look at the top, we can see that there are 70,000 files on this, but we only have around 20 to 30,000 ROMs. My card has a mix of Chinese ROMs and normal English ones, so it's possible that we do have a lot of duplicates here. One thing that is very strange about this SD card is that it doesn't seem to come with a lot of Mario games. This is kind of just like an anecdote, but I have heard that companies like Palkitty don't include Mario ROMs because they think that gives them a better chance of not getting in trouble over IP violations. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me given that we have this many games, but this is why you won't find many popular Mario games on this card. For example, here's the top 100 Super Nintendo games, and you'd assume that Super Mario World would be on that list, but it's nowhere to be found. In the N64 section, we have most of the library here, but there is no Super Mario 64 or Mario Kart 64. We do have Super Smash Bros, which doesn't make sense because it has Mario on the cover, but whatever. We also don't appear to have Pokemon games on this card, so this must be intentional. But yeah, there is a lot on this card. I don't want to spend too long on the low-end systems, but I did want to show off a few games from some of the systems that we didn't look at last time in Just Enough Linux. When it comes to PlayStation 1, we're able to get really good performance at 2x native resolution using the DuckStation standalone emulator. It's also important to note that I have set the CPU governor to performance, so we should not be leaving any performance on the table. Our second system is Dreamcast and Sega Arcade, and for this we're going to be using the Flycast RA Core. These games run great on this system. We didn't look at N64 performance, so I wanted to take a look at a couple of games. Here's Nintendo 64 with the Moopin 64 core, and these games are running really well, but I think the sensitivity on the left analog stick is just a bit too high for Goldeneye. The last low-end system that we're gonna look at is PlayStation Portable, and for this, we're gonna be running these games at 1x native resolution. They still run great, and even God of War has no problem on this platform.
Look out for to engage. Now this is our first big system, and you might recall that we did take a look at PlayStation 2 emulation in the last video, but we did that in Android. I had no idea that this device would be able to run the same emulator under Linux, and I'm surprised by the performance that we're able to get here. In some instances, I think that it's even better than what we saw in Android. We're only running these games at native resolution, but still, we're able to get some big games like Final Fantasy XII to run very well on this, and I'm very surprised that this device can perform this well for $115. I'm happy some packages supposed to be arriving by courier in the morning, uh, perhaps you may. Yeah. And like I already showed earlier on in the video, this device can run 3DS. This is something that also took me by surprise and I found out only after filming my last video. Inside this system, we do have the ability to use the Citra Core and we can use the new Vulkan update to be able to play a lot of games at full speed or very close to full speed. Unfortunately, we don't have an FPS counter for this, so you will have to pay attention to the audio to see how well the system is running. The only issue that I found is that the touch controls don't work right now, but this issue is already known. So even though Ocarina of Time 3D can run very well, as you can see right here, it's not really playable without being able to touch that second screen. But this is the system that I was hyped about the most. Here's GameCube emulation on this device, and we're gonna start off with games that don't run that well just to give you a full picture. For some of these games, I do think that there is a possibility that they could run, but we don't have the settings that we need to be able to get them to run. So that would be things like F-Zero GX. I would expect this to be closer to full speed if we could overclock the device to 300%. Right now there is a cap at 150% and that's not enough to get us full speed. The only game that I tried to play that I was a bit disappointed with was Super Mario Sunshine. In this stage right here, it seemed like the game would run very well, but when I finally got into the full stage, the game slowed down, so I don't consider this game playable at all outside of this section right here.
¡Voy a romper a pedazos! That leaves us with Wii emulation, and this is something that this device cannot really do well. There might be some lower end games that can run, but I would expect something like this to be able to run on this device, and it doesn't, and that's probably a mix between the hardware being too weak and not having enough access over the controls of the emulator. So even though Super Mario Galaxy is running pretty slow here, I do think that we could get this game to run at full speed under Android if we ever get a build that's good enough to use. But yeah, this is really awesome emulation performance, and a lot of systems that I was not expecting to even run at all on this device do run pretty well. I don't plan to do another video on this device, so I'm going to wrap up this video with my pros and cons after using it for this long. My first pro for me is that this device is open source. We don't have a lot of powerful open source handhelds at this point, and until 3588 handhelds hit the market, this is one of the more powerful options out there. The second for me would be the price. It would have been better to get this under $100, which I believe is possible, but $115 isn't that bad for the hardware that is on offer. Lastly, the emulation performance of the higher end systems was above my expectations. Things like PlayStation 2, some 3DS, and some GameCube were a lot better than I thought was possible on this hardware. Now for the cons. The first and the biggest con for me is obviously the screen tearing. This is kind of a deal breaker for me at this point, so I hope that this is fixed while this hardware is still relevant, or another OS built with an older kernel releases soon to have a normal base image for people to use while they wait. The second con for me is the build quality of this device. The plastic quality isn't great, and you could say that for a lot of products from Palkitty. I don't know why this is such a struggle for them, but it is. On the spectrum of best plastic quality in the world to a McDonald's toy, this is probably a bit under halfway. The third con for me is the shoulder button layout. I hate this combination of analog placement with inline shoulder buttons. It's kind of crap, and a lot of games that I wanted to play from the higher end systems were more annoying to play than they should have been. Finally, this device has really slow charging speeds, as I pointed out in my first video. But that's going to wrap up things for me on this one. If you haven't already bought one of these and you're on the fence, I would personally recommend grabbing one when the screen tearing issue is fixed. I don't know if the device will still sell for $115 when that happens, but it will be more worth whatever the future price is when it happens. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see another, take a look at a video that I did on the INEO Air 1S. Happy gaming everyone, Taki out.